I invite you to open up in your Bibles to Jeremiah, the first chapter. Russell said he didn't know what I was going to talk about this morning. I'm not always, not always sure until I get up here. I know at least what's on the paper, but you never really know what's going to come out until you're up here. Uh, but we're going to eventually get to Jeremiah chapter 1 as we examine uh, a lot of different things this morning. We're going to talk about five times that God used young people to change the world. And by saying that, I make no bones about my direct audience this morning. My direct audience this morning is young people. If you are a young person, I will let you define that age range for yourself. If you are a young person... This lesson is designed for you. But there will also be hopefully things that we can take uh, for all of us this morning as we examine our responsibility to God from a very personal, individualistic basis. I want to thank the people that led services this morning. Colton sent me the list last night. I noticed he did all supplements, which I don't know. If you're a song leader, you know how much guts that takes to lead all supplemental songs. So I want to thank him for that, uh, for having the courage to do that. I thought he did a fantastic job. Russ, with the scripture reading, adding some comments on that. And Jack, of course, for his uh, for his communion talk. And I think, I think that always adds a little bit extra to that. And of course, Jeff, for leading us in prayer. Everybody that took part in services this morning, I want to thank you for your time. Not only being up here, but also for preparing for comments uh, to have this morning as well. You may not realize it as you look at my family, but me and my three brothers, I am the best athlete in the family. You weren't supposed to laugh at that. That was not very kind of you. I am by far the best athlete. I don't care how many trophies Garrett has. I don't care how many all-state championships and teams he was on. I am the best athlete in the family. And I know that because my seventh grade intramural volleyball team won the entire school championship. And I was the one who won it for them. I remember like I was yesterday. I was sitting there and I was, I was kind of rotating in as intramural teams do. And I remember holding the volleyball in my hand. It is to this day one of the only times in my life I've ever actually played volleyball and I remember hitting it as the game there's the match point went over the net and it fell gently between two people who were not even really paying attention that much and of course as the championship unfolded everyone came screaming from the sidelines at least that's kind of how it played out in my own mind they hoisted me on my shoulders and then I went to homeroom that's kind of how that whole situation played out but I am the best athlete in my family I will be I'll be completely honest with that and I think that as I examine that time in my life I'm right there on par with other great young people that seems to have done so much in their life. For instance, people such as Adam Kirby, who is one of the youngest members of Mensa, who read a book on how to potty train himself and then potty trained himself at the age of two. I think that's a fantastic achievement. Mine's right alongside that. Or somebody like Kim Eun Young, who started talking when he was just four months old, knew both English and Chinese, I think by his first birthday, began solving physics problems by the age of three and then went to work for NASA at the age of 12. I know how these people feel. You know, when you're young prodigies, when you just are one of those people that just seems like it, it blows everybody else out of the water, it's hard to be that great. And obviously I'm being facetious when I say that. But you know, as you look at these young people, and all of us know young people and may not have accomplished things like on this level, but as we all know, we all know young people that seems like they just rise above and seems like they just inspire us, whether that's something that's very public, whether it's something very private, but we all have young people that we, at least on some level, look up to. And there are a lot of young people in this building this morning that I look up to, that are, inspire me to be a better person, that drive me to be maybe more fair in my preaching, to be more compassionate, to be more aggressive. And I see what they do in everyday life, and it's just astounding. And what these things teach us when we see young people like that is it teaches us ultimately that age is just a number. That whether you're 8 or whether you're 80, whether you're 12, whether you're 120, whether you're right there in the middle of 50 years old, it really doesn't matter. Because after all, we're all hopefully, as long as you're a Christian, we're all servants of God. We should all be servants of God. Age is really just a number. But I I think sometimes when we talk about young people, and I hear this sometimes in prayers here and in other places, I hear it in conversations, we oftentimes refer to young people as being the church of the future. The young people aren't necessarily the church of the future. They're the church of now. And sometimes when we talk about people, we either talk about what they will do when they get older, or we talk about, when we're talking about older people, what they used to do when they were younger. And both of those extremist type of positions, in my opinion, are flawed. Because it doesn't matter what age you are. All of us are designed to serve God in the best capacity that we possibly can at this 
this exact moment in your life. And it doesn't matter whether you're old or whether you're very young. Paul said as much, for instance, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, when he commanded Timothy, who no doubt encountered a whole lot of this type of condescension. He said, let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Timothy was a very impressive human being, having traveled on at least one missionary journey with Paul, probably two, but somebody who was face to face with him. And so as Paul sent Timothy off, now they're being separated, and Timothy goes into some of these churches who have been established for 10, 15 years who have their own issues, who have their own problems, many of whom may have undergone persecution. And he stands up and he starts talking to them about what the gospel is. It's very easy for him to kind of shy back from that and say, well, because I don't have as much life experience or because I don't have as much knowledge as these people do, or maybe because I'm just not old enough, then maybe I'm not really thoroughly equipped to be presenting this information and helping people. And Paul negates all of that when he says, let no one look down on your youthfulness, but in speech, in conduct, in love and faith and purity, be an example to those types of people. That's the admonition. And you young people who are doing this in everyday life, I want you to know that you are an example to people like me. And I want you to know that you are an example to our deacons. I want you to know that you are an example to our elders. I want you to know that you are an example to the people that you sit next to. Not because these people necessarily idolize you, but because they look at you and they think to themselves, if they can do it, then I can do it. Ladies and gentlemen, I get that a lot when I look in Scripture. I don't look at people like, for instance, David, who David stands in front of Goliath when an entire army, including, by the way, his three older brothers, that seems to be a theme this morning, his three older brothers who were in the army at the time, David stands up and he says, I'm going to go take on this Philistine because he's out there persecuting, he's out there defaming the name of God. So I'm going to go out there and I'm going to do something about it when nobody else did. And not only did he do the right thing, he also said the right things alongside of that. You think of somebody like Esther, or Esther as I sometimes pronounce her, who is no doubt a younger lady at the point in time where she is then confronted with a plot to assassinate over a million people, and her uncle Mordecai says, you know what, maybe it's just been for this moment that you've been positioned here at this time period for you to save, literally, literally save the world. And how much of a burden and responsibility would that be on Esther at that point in time to think to herself, this is something I need to be doing? Or somebody like Jeremiah, who is not necessarily a young person through his entire book, but certainly whose work expands the entirety of his lifetime. Jeremiah, who on a number of occasions stood by himself, completely alone, against everybody around him. When everybody told him not only that he was crazy, not only did they not want to listen to what he had to say, not only did they throw him into a pit of water, of sewage, and left him there, but also went through untold numbers of other persecutions in his lifetime ministry to try a failing mission to get Israel back on track. Also, somebody like Daniel. And his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who stood when the only people, when everybody else in the kingdom was bowing to the idol, his friends stood up because they were not going to worship this idol that was made by human hands. And Daniel, who on several different occasions decided that he was not going to take part in the changing of his life to become like one of the Babylonians, he stood up at a point in time when it would have been very financially advantageous for him to sit down. Daniel stood up, and he kept standing up, and he kept standing up, even when he was really young. What do you think about somebody like Mary? You know, oftentimes when we talk about Mary, we talk about her kind of in the backdrop of Jesus and how she was nothing more than the vessel with which to bring the Messiah into the world. And I'm not saying that to defame her by any means, but I think sometimes in our study of her, that's the way we kind of appropriate her. And yet, Mary was a remarkable individual. Can you think about what it must have been like in her time period to go through what she was going through, being pregnant before she was married in a small town, and then her husband possibly wanting to put her away because he thinks that she did something, and not only that, but then puts up with this and then gives birth to the Messiah and watches as he grows. Can you imagine, by the way, I'm a parent. It's hard enough for me not to get Levi to eat the bran flakes every morning. I cannot imagine being the father of or being the father of Jesus, being entrusted with that type of responsibility. And then Mary, no doubt, as she's a somewhat older woman, watches her only son or her oldest son rather die on the cross for the sins of the entire world. What a responsibility. And all of these people had a remarkable amount of responsibility when they were very young in their life, when they were new, when everybody in society told them that you can just kind of stand on the sidelines and watch as the big boys take care of everything. These people didn't. 
And if you leave nothing here this morning with nothing else than this this morning, I want you to leave here with the understanding that no matter what age you are, especially if you're young, you too can make a spiritual impact in this world. All five of these people, or all eight if you include Daniel and his friends, all five of these people were young, they were faithful, they were passionate. And the challenge this morning, ladies and gentlemen, was not in finding five people in Scripture, but narrowing it down to five people. For instance, you have somebody like Samuel. Somebody like the servant girl from the, in 2 Kings chapter 5 that is at the time period of Naaman and Elisha. You have Josiah who set his heart at 16 to serve God. Paul's nephew that comes into the equation to save Paul's life. There's all these stories throughout Scripture of all this. So if you're a young person, I want you to know that no matter what age you are, you too can make a difference. But I want you to also think about this, if you're older than that. If you're older than 16, 20, whatever the age range is that you decided, if you don't count yourself as a young person, I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you to challenge the young people. I want you to not appropriate these people or push these people to the sideline and say, well, because you're 15 or because you're 18 or because you're 20 years old, you should just leave the song leading to the big boys. Or if you ever get into a Bible study, you need to call me because I can come in and fix things. I don't want us to get that mentality. I want us to challenge our young people. I want to bring them up and have those standards in their life. Our whole objective sometimes to be with young people especially. And I hear this from a lot of preachers, a lot of elders, a lot of Christians in a lot of different churches. They always say things like, I hope that we can keep our young people. If we can just keep our young people in the church, then everything will be fine in the future. And I understand where they're coming from, but the way to keep kids in the church is not by calling them kids. The way to keep kids in the church is by challenging them, by entrusting them with responsibility, and by asking them to contribute. Because we will only be a part of a group if we feel like we can contribute, if we're valued, if we're cherished. When you look, for instance, at Jeremiah chapter 1, starting in verse 4, can you imagine the responsibility that is placed on Jeremiah at this point in time? And in Jeremiah chapter 1, starting in verse 4, God says, Now before I formed you in the womb, Jeremiah, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. And I have appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And I said, Alas, Lord God, I don't know how to speak because I'm a youth. And the Lord said, verse 7, Don't say I'm a youth because everywhere I send you, you shall go. And all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Jeremiah might have been a youth. He might have been somebody who was young. But he had the backing of Almighty God in his corner. And if we have a commission from God, if we are told through the Scriptures to go out and teach the Word, if we're told to be holy, if we're told to come out from among them and be separate, then we need to do that. No matter how fearful we may be. To do that. I want to tell you, tell you two different things. It used to be three points, and then I was told I didn't have as much time. I mean, it took one of my pages this morning. But I have two points for you this morning. I want you to listen to both of these. You do not have to face Goliath, ladies and gentlemen, to defeat giants. I remember what it was like to be in high school. It might have seemed like literally last millennium, last century. It might have seemed like forever, but I remember what it was like to be in high school. And I graduated with 532 people. It was a moderately good-sized high school. A lot of people in Greenville graduate with a similar amount of number. I met the two people that were next to me on graduation day. I had no idea that they were in my age or in my grade. And I remember what it was like to go through the hallways and have friends who had tried to get you to do different things. I remember having a lot of hormones going on and a lot of questions and a lot of considerations about everyday life. Am I supposed to do this? Am I supposed to go here? Should I really engage in that? I don't know if this is going to lead to that. It's all these questions that go on. And then you come to Bible class on Sunday and you read a story, for instance, about David, who at 16, 15, whatever his age was, came out and slew a giant. And then you think to yourself, well, this stuff that I'm going through is just small potatoes compared to that. I can't ever compare to David because, after all, he slew giants. I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that if you are trying to live as a Christian in today's world, and really in any day in the age, but if you are trying to live as a Christian every single day and doing your best to maintain purity, to be a light, to focus on Christ, then you are fighting giants every single day. You don't need to prove yourself. You don't have to say, well, because I didn't do this. That's the whole 1 Corinthians chapter 12 argument. Because I didn't do this, that must mean I not account too much. You don't have to prove yourself. I'll tell you right now that some of the hardest things and some of the hardest emotions you'll ever go through in your life are right now. And you may be hopefully well equipped later in life to handle the different things that take place. But the questions and the things that you're struggling with right now may be some of the hardest challenges you face in your entire life. 
2 Timothy chapter 2. I want you to flip over there. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 20. Second Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 20. It says, Now in a large house, Paul writes to the young evangelist, Now in a large house there are not only gold and silver vessels, but there are also vessels of wood and vessels of earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he'll be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now flee, verse 22, from youthful lust, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. The Lord's bondservant, verse 24, after all, must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong, with gentleness, accepting those who are in opposition. Perhaps God, hopefully, may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Nothing that Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, with the exception of the, the vessels of honor and dishonor, nothing that he says in these verses is, is really that much of a shock. Because it's nothing that he hasn't said elsewhere. It's nothing that he hasn't talked about elsewhere. Talking about fleeing youthful lust and making sure that you maintain purity and making sure that you set yourself an example. None of that is news. But I'll tell you right now, ladies and gentlemen, and especially young people, there are a lot of older people that struggle with this very thing that you may be encompassing or encountering for the very first time in your everyday life. And so if you sit there and you think to yourself, well, I'm not somebody because I'm not out there slaying giants. I'm not out there standing up to a king against idolatry. I'm here to tell you that those giants can manifest themselves in a variety of different ways. And don't get down for one second when you start to compare yourself to other people. Because what's a giant to you in your everyday life is all that really matters. And if the only thing that you can do at this point in time is, quote, be baptized, then that is the best thing that you can ever do. And your life will be filled with giants. You know, everyone always talks about these big moments in Scripture. We'll talk about this a little bit more here in a second. But everyone always talks about these big moments in Scripture. Jesus feeding the 5,000. You know why that happened? Because some kid had a few loaves and a few fishes. And I'm not saying it wouldn't have happened because Jesus could have made bread from rocks. But that whole incident started because a little kid had some food with him. That Jesus took and turned into a feast for thousands. And so if you think to yourself, all I have is that, I guarantee you God can use that to do things that you never thought possible. Don't get down on yourself with that type of stuff. I want you to also look at John, the first chapter. In John chapter 1. John chapter 1, starting in verse 35. One of the things that we th put a lot of emphasis on is this idea of evangelism, that we need to go out and convert the world. And I agree with that. That's what we should be doing, is going out and talking to as many people as possible. But conversions rarely happen in a single conversation. As a matter of fact, most oftentimes they're the result of several conversations, the result of lots of, not hopefully not arguments, but a lot of discussions about things, a lot back and forth, a lot of people interacting with them. And in John chapter 1, starting in verse 35, it says, Again, the next day John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Now one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He then, verse 41, first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He then brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Did you follow that chain? Did you follow that line of events that took place there in verses 35 through 42? It begins with John the Baptist, whose star, comparatively, according to Jesus, is kind of going down. John the Baptist is not having nearly the acclaim that he would have in his earlier years of ministry. And yet John the Baptist does one simple thing, looks at Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God, which prompts another action. It prompts these two people to then ask Jesus, Where are you staying? Which then prompts another action. We have found the Messiah. We think this is Him. Did you notice that at the end result of that, in verse 42, Peter is the product. And yet Peter is the product after a series of smaller incidents leading up to that moment. 
And you may feel like the things that you do in your life don't amount to much. You may feel as all those emotions are kicking up and all those hormones are thinking, all those things are happening in your brain. No one needs to know what's happening in my brain half the time, but that's a separate point. But you may feel that in your brain there's a whole lot of things happening and this little moment doesn't really amount to much. But as Paul himself said, I planted. Paul was watered, and it was God who gives the increase. So if you think for one second that your moments, the things that you struggle with, or those interactions that you have, that little stand that you made for Christ, won't ever amount to much, think again. Because the Bible is filled with little moments that amounted to bigger moments. Let me tell you this, secondly. You are creating today the person that you will be tomorrow. One of the dirty little secrets as I find out in my much older age, one of the dirty little secrets that I found out as I get older is that we spend half our life wishing that we're older and the other half wishing we were younger. And when you're a kid, you constantly think to yourself, man, when I get older, when I'm, man, when I get old, when I turn 28, I'm going to change the world. Or you may think to yourself when you're 28, when, when I turn 50, then I'll be able to retire and do all these things. And then when you're 50, you think when I turn 65 and I become an elder, then I can start to affect change. And we make that statement all over the place. We say, someday I will do these things. When the reality is, is that you are living and you are creating your life tomorrow, that you're creating your life today, that you will be tomorrow. Whatever person you will be 20 years from now is starting and is happening right now. And so if you think to yourself, well, I don't really need to study my Bible that much because after all, my parents bring me to church. Well, I don't need to spend much time in prayer because after all, Jeff does a great job, so I don't need to spend much time in prayer. I'm here to tell you right now that those habits that you're ingraining will be much more ingrained later in life. And if you're not a person of prayer right now, even if it's 10 second prayers, even if it's one prayer a week, even if it's one verse a month, then you will not be, or hopefully you, I'm wrong in this, but you probably, you might not be that person later because you're building those habits now. It's much easier to build those habits now than it is to try and build those habits later. Your value system, the things that are important to you, the things that are important to God, those are things that we need to get into our hearts now. That's why Solomon talks about in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Always remember, ladies and gentlemen, that Daniel did not start in the lion's den. I want to make that plain. Daniel did not start in the lion's den. Daniel started six chapters earlier when he said, I am not going to defile myself with the king's food. That's where that story began. And if the only thing you do at this point in your life, today, right now, is you say, I am not going to be like everybody else in the world, then that is a huge, huge, huge start in your life. You can ask the three elders that we have right now, Paul, Shell, and Cody. These elders not become elders all of a sudden. Well, maybe Shell did. I don't know. But these elders did not become elders all of a sudden. They became elders because they have dedicated their life. For however long a time, they have dedicated their life to the study and to the practice of God's will. And I know a lot of people that get to the end of their life and they think to themselves, I wonder why I didn't become an elder. Well, did you practice? Did you put in mind those things leading up to that? The only person that can answer that question is you. Look in Proverbs chapter 4, for instance. Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Proverbs chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Solomon writes, and we talked about this when our Proverbs class was going on. We talked about this kind of being a father-son dialogue. A lot of this is preparing possibly for royalty. And in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Hear, O sons, the instruction of a father. Give attention that you may gain understanding. For I give you sound teaching. Don't abandon my instruction. When I was a son to my father, tender and the only son of the side of my mother, then he taught me and he said to me, Let your heart hold fast my words. Keep my commandments and live. Acquire wisdom. Acquire understanding. Don't forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Don't forsake her and she will guard you. Love her. She will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom. And with all your acquiring, get understanding. Prize her. She will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place you on your head, a garland of grace, and she will present you with a crown of beauty. I understand full and well, young people, that the most important thing in your life right now might be Fortnite. I get that. But what should also be important to you is knowledge and is wisdom from God. And it's so easy for us to say, well, because I don't have the knowledge to do blank. If somebody talks to me about baptism, I don't, can't even think of one verse. Work to know one verse. 
Understand why you believe what you believe. Ask questions of everybody else that's here. But prize wisdom and prize understanding and grow in respect towards God now. Because it will be a pursuit that you have through the rest of your life. Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18, starting verse 1, jumping back to more or less the person that we began this all with. In Jeremiah chapter 18, starting in verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 18, starting in verse 1, it says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the, from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will announce my words to you. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something like the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hands of the potter, so he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. Now, I understand full well that Jeremiah 18 is talking about the nature of God's power, that God can create anything. He can take something, and he can break it down, and he can recreate it out of it. But I would challenge you to do is to be like that clay. You know, when you think about your life and you think about the path that you're on, it's very easy to think, well, this path that I'm on, I've already dedicated whew, a whopping six months to it, so I've got to keep going down to it. Don't be like that. If you're going down a path you know you shouldn't be going down, if you're friends with people you shouldn't be friends with, if you're making choices that you shouldn't make, it's never too late to pump the brakes and go in a different direction. Remake your heart. Remake your attitude. Remake your goals. In Jeremiah chapter 19, the logical downside of this is to take the other course. Jeremiah chapter 19 and verse 10. The only logical result of somebody who is so rigid and so engrossed in their life apart from God that they, they can't change is what he talks about here in Jeremiah 19 and verse 10. Then you are to break the jar in the sight of the men who accompany you and say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Just so I will break this people in this city, even as one who breaks a potter's vessel, which cannot again be repaired. And they will bury in Topheth, because there is no place for burial. This is how I will treat this place and its inhabitants, declares the Lord, so as to make this city like Topheth. The houses of Jerusalem, the houses of the kings of Judah, will be defiled like the place Topheth, because of all the houses on the rooftops. They burn sacrifices to all the heavenly hosts, poured out drink offerings to other gods. These are people who are completely apostates. Then Jeremiah came from Topheth, where the Lord had sent him to prophesy. And he stood in the court of the Lord's house and said to all the people, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I am about to bring on this city and all its towns the entire calamity that I have declared against it, because they have stiffened their necks so as not to heed my words. It is never too late, ladies and gentlemen, to change course and go in the direction that you know you should go. And that's for everybody, not just for young people. All of us have the opportunity to change our lives, no matter how many years, no matter how much time we've spent chasing one path. We all have the opportunity to reorient and make ourselves in the image of God. I would challenge you to do it one step at a time. Make the decision today that you'll be a little bit better than you were yesterday. Make a decision, well not tomorrow morning, but make a decision next school year. You'll show up on the first day of school and you'll be that person that says no to this one thing. You won't go there. But moreover than that, and I would argue possibly more important than that, be the person that talks even a little bit about God. Be the person who's just a little bit not ashamed to say a prayer. Be the person who's just a little bit exuberant about the hope that you have as a Christian. Just be a little bit better and be a little bit closer towards God then. Most of us are familiar, I would argue, with Rosa Parks. She has been called the mother of the freedom movement, the first lady of civil rights. But what most people don't realize is that a few months before Rosa Parks, there was another little girl named Claudette Colvin, a 15-year-old girl in the exact same town, Montgomery, Alabama, who did the same things nine months earlier. Most people don't know about Claudette because Rosa Parks' story broke not long after that and became the national flashpoint of race relations. And yet Claudette Colvin did the exact same thing that Rosa Parks did, much younger than Rosa Parks. As a matter of fact, she was 27 years younger and stood up to a white man and refused to give her place on the bus. Now, I'm not trying to diminish the importance of Claudette Colvin or exalt the importance of Rosa Parks. I think both of them are fantastic individuals of integrity for what they did in this moment. What I'm telling you is you don't have to be 30, 40 years old to make a difference. This girl who noticed injustice in the world, even though very few people in her immediate circle were doing this, this girl who noticed injustice in the world made a decision that she was going to stand up for what she knew was right. And you have that same opportunity right now. No matter if you're 15 years old or 500 years old, which if you're 500, i got some questions for you. No matter how old you are, you can make the decision right now to stand up for God. And you may be standing alone a little bit throughout the week, but that's the beauty of in-person services. We come together and we draw strength from one another. You are not alone. There are 7,000 people who haven't bowed the knee to Baal, as God famously told Elijah. 
You are not alone. We'll stand there with you. The only thing we ask is that you come while you stand and while we sing.